Perfect. Okay. So it's a little, a little technical issues. Sorry. Yeah. Um, as I said already, I'm uh, one of three managing directors. My uh, special part is the technology, the technical part of MP. And um, I would like to tell you this evening a little bit, as I said, back to the basics. So uh, look back to the past and to the present, as well as also uh, what is in the future, what is in the core making business, uh, what will be next time, uh, what is going to be the next developments. You're right, we have never been a standstill, we have always been trying to be a driver in a seat, uh, because otherwise you are pushed if you're not pulling, and that's the way we are doing. Uh, myself, I'm working now since 26 years in this business. I started uh, my job working in 1997 in Rupperberg. Uh, other German brand for core shoot was well known and uh, I started my uh, job there after I did my studies of mechanical and foundry engineering at the Aachen University in Germany and uh, since we merged the companies Rupperberg, Hottinger and Lempe in 2009 I was swapped over from the most run Australian area from the west middle part of Germany to the southwest where I'm located in the Black Forest area. Um, yeah, that's about my personal way. What we're doing, we are Lampe, Lampe, Mössner, Zinto, GmbH is the actual name of the company, Lampe, because of the founder of Mr. Joachim Lampe, who started the foundry in 1980. Uh, the family Mössner entered the business in 2005, as first as a financial partner, later on also as an operational partner, as Yugi Lampe, the founder and the, the, the main guy in the company came to death in a plane crash 2008. Suddenly, he was his own pilot with a small plane and he came into a thunderstorm and so he dropped down. So, 2008, Family Mustner came also in the operational storage and um, Sinto, this we added in 2015 when we had also a joint venture with the Japanese Sinto Kogyo company, which is going on. At the moment, we are about 370 supply, uh, employees in Germany. We have uh, a turnover about 16 million euros in peak. This is always a little bit uh, going up and down, uh, typically as it is in plant manufacturing. And um, the shares are the way that we have 60% owned by the family Mustler and 40% by the Japanese Sintokogio company. We have a quite good financial base. We have a equity ratio of about 60%, and uh, yeah, our projects starting from small machines, starting somewhere around 100,000 euro, 100,000 pounds, and going up to several millions if you have complete lines to install it with uh, automation parts on it. In general, we work with partners uh, all over the world with our network, and in total, we have Together with Hottinger and Röperberg and Lampe, we brought about 18,000 units into the market, starting from the early times of Röperberg in 1951 and ending up today. Where are we located? We are located in Germany in uh, five places. The original place was in the southwest of Germany, in Black Forest. This was the city of Schopfheim. There was the company founded in 1980 by Joachim Lampe and uh, after reunion of the two German states, the GDR and, and the, the Federal uh, Republic, we moved our, or we started an activity in the east of Germany, close to Magdeburg. And now this is the main place. It has also something to do with tax in different regions of Germany. So that's the reason why we have now moved our main place over there. It's also the main place of production and um, we do the production, we have the administration, our uh, part of the engineering is over there, and part of services. In the old place uh, we have uh, in, in Schopfheim, that's where my office is located, we are having the sales uh, for new machinery, we have having part of the sales for service and spare parts, we're doing it the main part of the engineering, and we have our R&D in this department. From the old Hottinger times, we have an office in Mannheim. There we took over our vision systems. 
So hopefully that it was, maybe some one of you knows that there was a company called Inspectomation. Uh, they're doing camera tests and checks for cores with cores. So then we, this we have integrated also into Lampa. We have in Kirchheim Unter Tech, this is close to Stuttgart, there we have a place where we have a company doing artificial intelligence and uh, data collection systems. And the latest one is close to Landshut in Bavaria in Erbersbach. This is our core production facility named Inacore because there we do only inorganic cores. And I uh, will tell you a little bit later about some details over that. Yeah, a rough overview about the history of Lampe. I think we don't have to go through the main, through all these details, just the main parts. Founded in 1980. In 2009, there was the merger with Hottinger and Röperwerk. In 2015, with Shinto. And now we are in 2018. This was the last big key point where we started to develop a 3D sand printer for serial production. Also there, I will tell you some details in the, uh, the following slides there over there. What is our portfolio? What do we do in the moment? We start, we do everything for the core shop. That's our special area. We have a wide variety of core shooting machines, starting with the L series, LL, LFB, LHL. These are the four main groups of core shooting machines serving the different needs of our customers. I always like to split our customers in, let's say, two groups. One is the jogging foundries, which do 5, 10, 30, 300 parts uh, per year of one type. And on the other hand, we have the big, mostly automotive foundries, uh, also some arbitrary foundries, who do 100,000 up to millions of one core a year. So they have for sure a certain different requests to the machinery. We have machines for all these units and we can serve their demands. As code box is still the main process, we have for sure the guessing units. We have all the kind of sense supply. We do the mixers. We have a wide automation department with robotics. And what is necessary absolutely is vision systems. If you want to do quality control and have no people, and if you have full automatic running lines, you need in somewhere, in some areas, to have some controls. And this we can do here automatically with cameras. And the last not least is the data systems where we collect data from the complete plan, from the system. It can be connected to your ERP system. It can help you to control and to run your core shop, also get information immediately on time, not Friday afternoon. You don't think Friday afternoon, what was the problem on Monday morning, then you cannot save anything. You need to have it within minutes. And for example, we have such a system installed in our own factory in the inner core. If there is a, a bad core and the operator pushes the button or pushes, pushes on, the, on, the, on, the, on the touch screen of the machine, bad core, and the NA has always to give five reasons why is the core bad. And if he does it three times after each other, the master, the, the, the four men in his office gets an alert to his screen, and he has to walk there. And then he can check and can help and assist the worker immediately. So you don't lose any time. Within minutes, you have the, the reason you have some specialists at sight. And this is really something what is more and more important for modern production, we are all under the pressure of efficiency to run our core shop with uh, the best profitability, with no knowledge of people in many cases. That's a lack of people. So this kind of data systems really deliver your data. It is not the artificial intelligence yet. It is just a collector of data. It just saves you time. You could theoretically also play as a guy beside every machine writing everything on a piece of paper and then hang it into an Excel table uh, later on. But then you don't have the on time and the online information. So this is really a very good tool to increase production. We started our Inacore facility uh, with the data system, the Inacore core, the Lampa core board. 
uh, we could increase just by data analysis and measures coming out from this, we could increase the production within a year by 20%. Just because we could we had the information and we could react very quickly. So that's a big point. Uh, and for sure you have to know what you do, you have to be a specialist in your field and then you can talk to your PC programmers uh, to create a program serving your demands. The latest development I told you before already is the additive core production. It's a 3D sand printer. Sand printing, you would say, okay, it's already known since 25 or 30 years. There was an original pattern from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology uh, having a layer of sand, jetting the binder in the certain places where the core should be created. Um, but at the end, all these kind of all these systems typically are run in a prototype or in a low series foundry. And typical building times or creating times of such a core was in the area of hours. We got a request from a German automotive manufacturer who said, hey, you are working on the core shops, you're dealing with core shooting machines, we have some printers from companies doing that, they work fine, they create cores, but we don't need a core every hour, we need a core every minute. It was a core package for a cylinder head where seven cores were shot in a very conventional way, and it was a totally crazy water jacket combination with the outlet, outlet channels that could not be made anymore with the tooling. No chance to create a tooling um, with, even with loose pieces or side parts or something like that. No chance to create such crazy design. And so there was the request to have a better cooling to your cylinder head to increase the combustion temperature in the engine block. Uh, to 1,400 degrees C. And we all know where aluminium has its melting point. So you melt up your cylinder head while you're driving. You need a very, very, very strong cooling directly to the outlet channels where they had a hot, hot exhaust gases went out there. And so there was a core created covering the fingers of this exhaust channel, very, very narrow to create that. And therefore, they needed to have the printed cores and a core a minute. Finally, we started our development. We talked to the players in the field. They didn't want to cooperate with us. They said, okay, you can do everything around, uh, but please leave us with the printer. And uh, we, we, we had some ideas how to modify the printer to get better speed. And finally, we did it ourselves. You see here, this is the latest development, the LTF, the Lambda Transformer, that's a 3D printer, and a microwave, because all that was in inorganic binder systems. We had to dry out the water from the cores. And uh, we started this development with uh, uh, a market available microwave oven that could finally not solve our problem. So we developed also the system. And what you see here on the right hand side, that's a complete system with a sand mixer, with a complete reclamation system. There is the printer, there is the microwave in the area, and here is the unpacking station. I will show you a few pictures more later on. And uh, in a combination of printers, we now manage to create a core a minute. So it's a jogging box in this uh, big printer here, of 1000 by 1400 millimeters which uh, will be filled in about 12 minutes with six cores in and we multiply some printers so at the end we have really the output uh, over there from a core a minute. Yeah, this is Ina core, what I mentioned before, this is our own core shop. Um, also here we were driven by the same automotive company, by BMW. They didn't have any space anymore in their factory. They didn't want to invest money in combustion engines, but they needed still the cores because the majority of the cars is still combustion engine. And they needed to have a supplier for inorganic cores. Here we started 2017. We got the starting point in April. And I remember quite well, it was St. Nicholas Day, 6th of December, 2017, 
we shot the first core. Before there was only, you see the picture here, there was only a roof. There was not even a wall, there was no energy supply, there was no floor in the factory, in this building, it was nothing. It was just a roof as a table for solar panels. And so we found this location, we equipped it with machinery, and since 2018 we are in serial production. And today we have uh, 60 employees, that's not true anymore, we are now more than 100, working in three shifts, working six days a week, sometimes seven days a week to fulfill the, uh, the demand, of course. Here we do about 2,500 engine block core packages a day for BMW. We are doing intake housings for Huntman, and uh, we have also uh, for electrical motors, we have for Colvin Schmidt, KS, BRU, in Neckarsulm, we also supply engine houses for electromotors. The production is fully automated. It is uh, an arrangement of eight core shooting machines, two mixing plants, fully robotized. So the cores will be taken out, will be defined automatically, and then we have the people just to pick it up from the shuttle and drop the cores into shelves. We have our, our own climber storage because the inorganic cores are quite sensitive to climber uh, influences. And uh, yeah, we combined the know-how we had in-house uh, with a lot of practical experience that we made when we started with the company. Because making machines, designing machines is one thing, operating, I think you all know that is a very different thing. We learned a lot with that. For us, it is a perfect um, addition to the machine making. We open, we open new business fields. Because the core shop in many foundries is a little bit the unloved child. No one really wants to put money in there, wants to invest in there. Uh, lack of people is an issue. And um, we, for sure, also educate our own people, our electricians, our mechanics, not to be just a machine maker, but also to be able to shoot a core and to find what is the problem if there is no good core coming out from the machine. Uh, we have extended it and now also with the tooling manufacturing, uh, sorry, maintenance shop, not manufacturing. So we do also the complete maintenance of the tooling for us and now also for external customers. So BMW, for example, they deliver all the dirty and worn out core boxes to us. We clean them, we have an ultrasonic cleaning uh, line, we have welding, we have machining facilities at site. And I think this is a little bit different to a, let's say, normal pattern maker. After we have overworked the core boxes, we have the chance to test the core box because we have the same machinery uh, that BMW has. So every core box that leaves our maintenance department get at least five to 10 shots. And the core box is measured with the GOM system and also the result, the course will be measured so that we can be sure after the maintenance, after milling, after welding, uh, we deliver a core box that works to the customer. New field of activities which is quite successful. Yeah, core processes, as I said, back some, some basics. Um, you know, we have different core production systems. Uh, we have some specials with green sand or oil sand or maybe also some, some low bakes. But what is based on the machinery made cores, uh, typically core shooters is the cold hardening by cold box CO2 or beta sets. We have the hot curing like hot box or shell. We have this kind of combination processes like the inorganics where you have a hot core box and you have a gassing, not with a reactive gas, but with hot air. And this at the end ends up in core shooters where we would go a little bit more in the depth today. Um, I was asked to write an article in a lecture book also for educational foundry guys and they asked me, yeah, please make a definition, what is core shooting? And I tried to define that on a, yeah, let's say a theoretical way to make it a little bit more scientific and understandable what really happens in a core shooter because a core shooter somewhere inside gets a little bit of miracle. So I have made this, this sentence, core shooting describes the abrupt expansion of a sufficiently large volume of air in relation to the molding material, the sand, volume through molding material volume in order to fluidize it and to drive it 
the fluidized mixture into a core or a mold cavity by means of temporarily and locally variable two-phase flow. Sounds pretty theoretically, but at the end it brings down what it really is. We have to mix up a solid, the granular sand, which is mixed before, with air, and then every sand grain flies in a cushion of air into the direction of the gradient of the pressure. You have an overpressure in the shooting system and you have no pressure, no overpressure in your core box. And so, um, as water is always flying, uh, floating down, floating down the hill, the pressure goes into the core box and drives the sand mix down there. The ratio, this is an important part, now we come to the design of the air and the sand volume should be at least five to one. So you need five times, at least five times more air than your sand volume. If you have a 20 liter machine, you need, should have somewhere 100 liters sand at le uh, air at least to have a sufficient fluidization. And for sure, curing, this is something that takes in a kind of specific manner that depends if you have a cold box system with a amine gassing or if you have a uh, hot box system which is working with uh, heat reaction. Yeah, then we come directly into the practical parts, different shooting systems. It's a big question of philosophy. And I remember when more than uh, 25 years ago I started my job uh, in Rupert, I asked which shooting system is the best, where is the advantages and different disadvantages of the shooting system. And the simple answer was, well, yeah, well, our shooting system is the best. And I didn't stop asking why, and no one could at the end really explain why is that or should that be the best one. So I tried to analyze that a little bit more, and at the end there are two main ways of shooting systems available. One here on the left side, you see there is a shooting tube or a sand cylinder, what it is called, where the air comes in from the side through little slots or little holes and goes into the sand area, fluidizes the sand in this area and drives it down into the core box. The second one has a straight and a, a solid wall and it just enters the air through a filter from the top. And I try to analyze a little bit what is advantages and disadvantages because nothing is 100% perfect. You have always advantages and disadvantages. And so I tried here with some plus and minus signs to find out what is really the better one. For sure, the sand cylinder, the sand tube, which enters the air also from the side, gives you the opportunity to fluidize your sand mix better. Because you bring in the air from the side, you have no channel building in the sand. You have a turbulence, a higher turbulence in there. This results in a potentially lower shooting pressure because the fluidization is the first start. Otherwise, you cannot move through your sand. I know some competitors, they write in their flyers and folders, we don't fluidize. I think that's a big misunderstanding because uh, they want to say we don't have porous cores. We have no air in the core, but if you don't fluidize, if that would work, you could just take a hydraulic cylinder on top of the core shooter and just press with the hydraulic cylinder on the sand and uh, the sand will not move. It will not go through the shooting nozzles. It will not go in the smallest corners of your core box. So you need to have this fluidization. You need to have this two-phase sand and air flow to make this mixture driving and moving. And because you have the slots also in the side of this shooting tube, you have also might have a quicker exhaust because this air, the rest air, must not go through all the sand to all the top because it can also bypass and uh, detour around the corner. For sure there's a negative thing, it's the cleaning and the handling of this shooting tube. Especially if you have bigger machines, 40 liters and more, it's not very comfortable to handle this shooting tube. Somewhere from 40, 50 liter, you need at least two people to move and to do that. And it is also a little bit of work to clean them. Shooting just from the top, for sure, the biggest thing, you have less cleaning requirements. 
it's easy just to take out this filter, this screen from the top. It can be shot blasted, uh, sand blasted, or used with some uh, cleaning agents to clean that. So you have an easier handling, as I said before, especially for the bigger machines where the shooting volume extends. It's difficult to handle the split shooting tubes. And I will show you at the end a big machine that we solved there. It was impossible to make a shooting tube. The negative parts of these shooting systems are the danger of forming some channels and some breachings inside there because the sand likes to flow. If you have an outlet nozzle in the bottom, then it will create a channel and you don't mix up this channel. What the sand cylinder, the shooting tube does because of the air inlet from the side, you crash this kind of breaching or channels and better. And for sure you have a little lower fluidization. So what is the best system? I think you cannot say one system is the best. It really depends a little bit to your application. For smaller machines up to, what I said, 25 or 40 liters, I'm absolutely a fan of the shooting tubes because of the advantages. For bigger machines, I would uh, go and recommend to go with the top filter system. I did also some tests uh, with an identical machine, having both shooting systems on board, so we could modify that. And um, I made a core, a simple test core. And you see on this diagram, you see on the left-hand side, on the, on the y-axis, there is the weight of the core. And on the x-axis, we have the shooting pressure. The red one, is the test here on the left with the sand, uh, with the shooting tube. And the green line is without a shooting tube shot at two and a half bars. So you see, if you have a look to the diagram, at only two bar, two and a half bar, you get already a complete core. With two and a half bar and only shooting from the top, there was no complete core. You saw, you see what I, what I created here. There. So the more pressure you have, the more equal became both systems. And if you are somewhere around four and five bars, you see then both curves are going more or less the same with a bigger machine. So here you see you can compensate the less than the, the lower fluidization with the sand uh, with the sand tube machines. Also, you can compensate it with a higher shooting pressure in some times. It depends for sure to the core, to core design. Um, so also this is a kind of, of approval that both systems have their issues and both systems have their advantages and they can work both. And today we create and we build and we deliver machines with both versions. The beginner, the smaller ones with a sand cylinder, with a shooting tube and the bigger ones without. To understand what happens really in the shooting system, we equip the machine with high-speed pressure sensors. You see on the left side there is a cut through machine. We put pressure sensors in the air tank in front of the shooting valve, behind the shooting valve, beside the shooting tube, inside the shooting tube, and also even in the core box we place these piezo sensors to find out what happens during the shot. The shot is a quite dynamic operation, and uh, yeah, we wanted to find out what, what really happens. This is the result. It's some curves. This shows a complete cycle of a cold box core making cycle. You see the red line starting from 5.5 bar. This is the air tank. The air tank was filled with 5.5 bar, and once I opened the shooting valve, for sure the pressure immediately dropped down, the way down. In, sorry, it was the pink line, the pink one. The pink one is the, is, the, is the pressure tank. The red, the green, and this pink one, these are the sensors in the sand system itself. You see, can see quite good how the pressure from the top to the bottom builds up. And this beige curve here in the bottom, this is the pressure in the core box. 
And this is quite a crucial thing because many people ask, for example, for closing forces or core shooters because they say we want to drive our shooting systems with five bar, with six bar, and our core box is one square meter. One square meter times one bar gives you a reaction force of 10 tons. So if you have a big core box, one by one meter, you shoot with six bar, there should be theoretically at least 60 tons closing force of the machines. 60 tons. This means big hydraulic cylinders, very, very stable core boxes. And from experience, we knew that even smaller or lower clamping forces would work, but we couldn't prove. Here, with this kind of measures, we could prove it the first time what really happens in a machine. This curve is an average of 80 different types of cores. The smallest one was 80 gram. The biggest one was 180 kilogram. And the funny thing was, there was no big difference. There was no big difference. It was more or less the same curves. So this is really the average of these 180 different types. And um, you see at the bottom also the line of the core. In the core box, you see also the guessing phase. Wonderful. You can see the, the ramping up of the, of, the, of the pressure ramp when you guess with Amy. You have the perching time and the depressurizing. Go a little bit more into detail, the same curve, but only the first five or six seconds. You can also see what happens really in the moment of the shot. And here you can also prove why we call it core shooting and not core blowing, because it's really a shot, it's an immediate reaction. You can see quite well how the pressure in the air tank drops how the pressure in the sand system rises up immediately and the more close you come to the core box, the pressure sinks down and certain after half a second, the pressure in the core box starts to rise. We did some glass windows in the core box and did some high speed camera tests. So this was exactly the moment when the core box was filled. So as long as the core box is in the filling process, all the vents are quite open and you have to go to deventing and exhaust from the core box. But once the core box is really filled, then you see this pressure build up because you typically fill it from the bottom. So your bottom vents are first closed and then all the air has to go to the top. And so you can see if the pressure rises in the core box, the shot is done. And this was also a funny thing between 80 gram and 180 kilogram, uh, the shot was always around about half a second. So many people shoot three, four, five, six seconds. If you see that from my experience, it's a complete misdesign of the diameters of the, of the inlet and the outlets and the vents. Because you can see on the pink line here on the top, this is your pressure in the tank, and this pressure drops immediately in the first tenth of a second. So after four or five seconds, you have no pressure anymore, and your machine is just, just sending the last breath. There is no driving anymore. So a shot must be a shot. At sand, what is lying once in a position, you will not move anymore again. So if you shoot two time, two seconds, four seconds, or longer, you have typically an issue with your venting, ventilation in the core box with the diameters of the filling, and you will press air through your sand, you dry out your sand, you take away the solvents from the sand, and you will not increase your core quality. So that's really something you should have a look through. I see it quite often when we visit customers that they shoot quite long. And if you ask, why do you do it? Because the guy in the night shift before they did it and it was set up like that, I didn't change it. And typically, if I reduce that to one and a half or two seconds, because maybe you have some reaction time of the valves, um, more is not needed, typically. And you save a lot of air, you save a lot of binder solvents. It really increases your quality if you reduce that and bring this ratio of inlet and outlet in a good, uh, in a good manner. 
form the cold box processes or all kind of cold and gas hardening processes. We have this kind of gas generators. Here you see a schematic. Um, how does it work? You have a canister or you have an integrated tank for the amine, for the liquid. You have a dosing pump and you have a big heater. So crucial here is that you evaporate your amine completely. It should not go liquid into the core box. So you should have a pre-dosing, bring the amine in the heater, evaporate it before you open the outlet valve. The outlet valve is here, this valve. So we dose typically our the liquid amine into the heater to have the vapor of the amine already in the, in the, in the heater before we open the valve. What is hardening, especially in, in, in cold box? The amine is called the catalyst. For the chemical people, they say, okay, a catalyst is not consumed. It is just makes a reaction happening. So theoretically, you could take with this little spincer one molecule of amine and hold it to every grain of sand in your coal box. What is a little bit difficult in a practical way, for sure. So we need to distribute the amine quite well. But there is no consumption of amine. Many people ask, okay, how much AV do I need for this core? Theoretically, one molecule. And at the end, you still get the molecule out. But there is some old, let's say, some rules where you say, okay, one kilogram of core, one gram of AV, something like that. This for sure works always. But then you can reduce tremendously. We did with the Farmer Institute in Aachen uh, such a test apparatus here where we had a core. Uh, or this, uh, this was a tube filled with a sand mix and from the gas unit we sent in a one-dimensional way because it's just a single uh, pipe we sent the gas into the core and we had some ultrasonic sensors where we could detect the hardening and you could see that we if you manage to get your aim in like a complete front going through your core. If you have a horizontal shot, do it like that. You have the best distribution. Make sure the aim is really getting into every corner and going in there. The old way was to dose the amount of AV you wanted to, uh, to, to put in the core, to dose in the first moment, put it in the heater and get it on there. We modified our controls of the gas units in this way that you can do a pre and after dosing. Even years ago we did that, but I think very few people really use that. We pushed that up also in a, in a test line a little bit longer and uh, did several trials on that. And so we split the dosing into two, three, or even four steps, giving a little bit of aiming, only a quarter of the number of, of the amount, and press it through the core, try to make one front and press it through the core, and then give the second, the third, and the fourth uh, portion of that. And after that, only then we rise up the pressure. So the first thing was between 0.5 and 1 bar, and after a certain time, after the last dosing step, then we rise up the pressure to 4 or 5 bars for birching. At the end, with splitting of the dosing, in three or four portions, especially for bigger cores. You could save 25% aiming and time. Because we leave and we let the aiming to have the time, the aiming reaction needs two to three seconds, the polyurethane reaction. And you need to give the aiming the time to really go in there and contact with every sand grain. If you just put one big amount of amine and immediately you rise up your pressure and press it out, most of the amine is quite lazy, it's going straight out without doing its job in the core. And so here there is the biggest, because the, the, the hardening time typically is the biggest time consuming part of your core manufacturing. And here is also the biggest potential for optimizations. We just did a joint founder in Germany, they did a big pump housing, it was 300 kilogram and we could bring it with no changes on the machine, with a few changes on the venting on the core box, we could bring it from six minutes guessing time to, 100, uh, to, 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 to two minutes, 120 seconds. It took me two hours from six minutes 
to two minutes. So reducing, this was an extreme, but 10, 15 seconds you catch all the time if you do that really strictly on, on that. Really recommendable on there. Yeah, from all that, we try to create some, let's say, rule of thumb. As I said before, the filling time is between 0.3 and 0.5 seconds. Check at your core shops how long is your shooting time set up. If they are tremendously longer, you should have a look to your nozzles and to your ventings. Multiple shots. Some people like to have saving money, buying a small machine, but they have bigger cores. For some cores it works, but remember, one ascent which is already sitting somewhere, you will never move again. And so multiple shots is always a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, a compromise. If you don't have a bigger machine and you have just a few cores, it might work. But this is something that is really difficult. The biggest thing is also this kind of long shooting times and multiple shots, what often comes together, really say gives the, gives the result that you blow a lot of air through your sand, you dry out your sand, you dry out the solvents in the binder, and the solvents, this is the one thing what makes the binder reaction happen. So this is something really critical, and if you keep these this diagrams in mind, uh, that's a point over there. You see this little core on the right-hand side? That's not my little brother, that's me who is standing beside this core. That's a 2,250 kilogram core. It's a 1,700 liter machine. Also here we had zero. Uh, we can do it also to, <laughs> no, this is a two in the box, three by three meter. That's the biggest option here, and that's, uh, but even here we had a shooting time set to the monitor of 1.5 seconds. 1.5 seconds for two tons of set. Yeah, pressure in the call box. During the shooting, the pressure is normally not more than a half to one bar. So you don't need these crazy clamping forces. You don't need to increase the stability of your core boxes that strong. And during the guessing phase, okay, you might have a little bit more. It's 1.5, maybe 2, but that's it. So if you create your system for 3 or 3.5 three bar, you have enough spare capacity, even in a bad case, that some of your vents are blocked, but not more. You don't need to make firewood from your wooden core boxes with a high clamping force machine, something like that. The air tank, this is also a very good indicator for your process. If you have a look to your thermal gauge, to your pressure gauge from the air tank, the pressure must drop, otherwise you have no airflow. But it should not drop too much. So if you have something between two and three bar, a pressure drop in the tank during the shot, that's, from experience, a quite good value. If you have less pressure drop, it is an indicator that there is no flow. You have not enough ventilation dimension and not enough cross-section. If you have a bigger drop of pressure, might be the venting is too big or your core shooter has a too small tank on the top. And as I said before, the closing forces clearly are, are depending to this uh, 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 forces into the call boxes. Uh, the effective area typically is never one by one meter. If you have a call box application area in this area, you have maximum 65%. And if you then calculate with two or two and a half bars, you can easily calculate what you need as a clamping force in your call boxes. Call box venting and gas inlet. So I try to make a few sketches here in the bottom um, where I try to point out what you can make wrong and what you can make correct. You see the wrong one here. The shooting nozzles are sitting directly opposite way to the venting nozzles. So you shoot directly on your vents with your good time with cleaning the vents. We have some side vents. So why should the gas, when it comes in from the top, go down all to the core? No, it would go this easy way, this way down. The ejectors are very tight in the bottom. 
if you compare it to this core box, we have much more vents in the top. We have a little distance between the core box and the shoe plate so that the air can go out through this vents and the air can pass in this area here and uh, disappear. So during the shooting process, you try to get the air out as quick as possible. During the guessing, the venting has another order to do. Then it must block the way that the alien is not just passing through. You must have a certain filing of that. That's the reason why we typically say we should have a ratio of two to one inlet to outlet. Then you create a kind of filing and the alien, there is an overpressure in the box and it will not lose the alien immediately. The ejector pins are made with a little conical shape in, in, the, in the guiding. So every time the ejector goes up and goes down, it cleans itself. Because if there is a little bit of sand going on and sticking on the ejector pins, you pull it down, you clean itself. The ejector pin has 0 0.1 up to 0 0.2 millimeters tolerance to its guiding. So it works as a venting nozzle. Typically, the vents you have to clean with the with, with little knives. Nice work for someone who killed mother and father. Uh, the bad work. These ejectors, they clean themselves every time they go up and they go down because of the conical shape and the guiding at the end. Open, the, in, in the bottom area, the sand falls down. And for sure, there should not be any opening to the side where the gas can be lost immediately. So try to get all the air down to the bottom and maybe in the partition line you can make some little slots. Uh, depends a little bit on the design. Also this is much easier than any vents because this when the corpus is open you can see immediately if there is some dirt, if there is some dust in there you can clean it just blow it away. If you have the vents you need to clean them with a the knife. So these are a few of these things uh, how to create a core box and if you go through your core box storage, uh, you will find a lot of core box, I can guarantee, which don't have this for certain uh, uh, points here. And there's a lot of, typically, a lot of room for improvement. So, some tips and tricks influence of the core fraction and temperature. Typically, in the past, we didn't have too much attention to this. It came or was driven by inorganic core making. Inorganic core making is very sensitive to ambient parameters. If the temperature is too cold, it's too, cold, it's too hot, is it uh, high humidity, dry air, you have something what you have to take care for. And so from this point, from the inorganics, you have the last years supplied, I would say, 70 to 80 percent of our mixing plants also now with sand sifters. The sand sifter is something that helps you to homogenize your quality of the sand. Might it be summer, might it be winter, might it be uh, reclaimed sand, might it be uh, uh, quality not a little bit shaking around that, because if you have a lot of fines in there, you need more binder because the surface is bigger. More binder and fine grain means that uh, um, gas, gas flowability, uh, permeability through the cores. So you create, you need more binders to get the core strengths. You block your venting even during the pouring process, which creates a lot of problems, may create problems in the pouring process. Your core making is uh, stronger. It takes longer, it takes longer time because the guessing is, is more difficult. If you have a controlled granularity, you can guess your course, you can identify your amount of binder. And if the sand is always in a certain temperature range, not five degrees, five degrees in the, in the winter time and 35 in the summer, you also have here more homogeneity in your quality. This kind of sifters, might it be a batch sifter or a silo sifter helps you to control your quality on the set. This is really an improvement. It reduces your scrap rates tremendously. And 
we have two types of the sifters, the typical batch sifter and we created a silo sifter. You see the difference here below. The sifter is a kind of fluid as bed. So the scent is sitting in this chamber here. And from the bottom chamber, we blow air from a big fan through the sand to create a fluid as bed. You see here in the, this is a view into this, come on. This is a little camera view into such a system. You see how the sun is bubbling. And you can imagine that fines, that the grains will be taken out. If you have a suction on top, if you have a little under pressure on the, on the vacuum on the top, you take out the fines from your scent. By pressure and by time, you can control this reaction. If you have a running system, many foundries have a problem with the height in their core shop. They cannot install an additional sifter, as it is shown here, because this is the day hopper. So that's the reason why we created this silo sifter. This combines both the day hopper and the sand sifter in one unit, so you don't have additional height to put on there. And this is really something what helps you to homogenize your quality. In the winter, you heat up. If you're going with organic binders, you should heat up your sand to somewhere around 18 to 25 degrees. Typically 20, 22 degrees is a very optimum point, uh, which does a uh, really good reaction on the, on the course. And in the summer, if it is 30, 35 degrees, the summers are getting hotter all over. Um, you have a longer bench life of your sand. If the sand is not 35 degrees, but it's only 25 degrees, you can stay much better with that. So this is really an improvement of quality and productivity. It costs a little bit of money in the investment, but this is paid back quite well. Okay, how does it work? Here we see the silo sifter. There is a big fan in the front. It can be equipped with an air cooler and an air dryer. And so we through some pipes with a speed sensor, we control the counter pressure of the sand. So we can react to the different filling levels of the sand sifter to create our fluid as bed. If you have high humidity areas, it is recommended to have this air cooler in front. It is an option, but it is recommended if you have higher humidity because then you condensate out the water from the ambient air and they don't bring your water into the sand. Because most of the coarse sand binder system, they are quite sensitive if you have water in your sand. This is the air cooler, how it works. It's yeah, working like, like an engine cooler. You suckle in the air. Here is a cold water connection and then the condensate water runs out and you get a cooled and dry air as a result from this fan, which is going to be used in your fluid as bed. Yeah, some other things, some tips and tricks about the design of your core boxes and shoe plates. This is a thing I see very, very often. You have some shooting model somewhere on a shoe plate and in the middle there is a big bunch of sand which will not be used. This bad man um, is dry sand, it is old sand, you always take a little bit of this dry out sand with your sand flow, which reduces your core quality. If you work with this kind of sand savers in this area, you save sand, you don't have to drop so much sand when you clean, you have a better flow, you have always fresh sand in the same areas. Also, this is something that really improves your quality. Another thing is the design of the shooting nozzle. If you have a shooting nozzle which has a very narrow gap, the sand needs to have a very, very high speed to go through. So try to make it as big as possible, as wide as possible, because this lowers your shooting pressure. It lowers the wear, it lowers the incrustation of the core box, and you don't have such a high imbalance of the incoming sand to your area. If necessary, you see this red um, fencing here on top. Sometimes uh, I've seen that with a good result, that you have this kind of screen on top of the nozzles, four or five millimeters square, which loosens up your sand flow even more, which has a better fluidization 
for critical cores, water jacket, fine areas, this is an option that needs to be tried out with your certain core box design. Yeah, this was core shooting, and now a brief introduction into printing. You, I guess you all know the printing. There we are. Yeah, core shooting versus core printing. Core shooting, your contour is limited to your tooling. Uh, you, you are limited to the way you can strip and you can open the tooling, the partition lines. Um, if you want to add additional gas channels in your core or you want to have a kind of gradient in your core, it's quite difficult to do so. You need a new tooling for every type of core. You need maintenance and storage for your toolings. And, and as a positive way, you have a full freedom of binder selection. We have hot box, cold box, we have everything in the, in the core shooting. 3D printing is completely tool free. You have a full freedom of shape. You can make gradient or even hollow cores. You can make complex degassing channels and hollow areas. The contour can be printed in one piece. You don't need to assemble cores, also that's a big point. Sometimes you have to assemble a core package from several cores that you can now print together. You can do it directly from a 3D data file. You don't need any space to store your core boxes. You don't need to maintain any kind of core boxes but you're in the moment limited to Furan and Phonolic or to inorganic binders. So this is a first, let's say, neutral vision on that. As I said before, we developed the printing process, which was a, a very active, uh, into a serial production. Now we have a speed of more than 600 millimeter per second where we print and where we lay down the sand in both directions and we pack the complete cores automatically out from the jobbing box. So from the system, you see here, this is a cleaning system. Um, the cores need not to be digged out like an archaeologist, what it is within the standard system. This is more like a stereo production here. They will be cleaned completely with a robot. We took from our shelf the defining robots, gave them a cleaning nozzle with an airbrush in, the high, uh, in, in its hand, and now we clean with this uh, robots this kind of course. That's the first active system now. It's working in BMW. It's a combination of six printers. You see one, two, three, and three on the opposite side. It's a sand mixing plant in this area. It's a complete loop of the sand. All the not printed sand beside the course can be reused in the system and runs out there. And uh, now the funny thing. This installation is about 25 by 50 meters. It's a complete factory hall full of machinery. Costs more than 20 million and makes the production of one core shooting machine. So based on this, for sure, we, dis we also had to think about commercial issues. And I tried to put that a little bit in a, in a line together with the CO2 issue having a balance on the CO2 uh, production, what happens with that. And I compared a short core and a printed core. And you can see here, we took the core printing, we have the harding in a microwave, we have the kilowatt hours on the line, we list it up. It was the identical core, approximately five kilogram. I left away the mixer in this moment and any kind of unloading or after treatment. So it's just the core making process. And you see here, we consume about 3.29 kilowatt hours electrical energy for this core. 
And if I do it on a core shooter, I have only 0 0.76. So I have at the end a factor of 4.3. 4.3 times more CO2, more energy for the printed cores. Printed cores is the future. Mm. If you calculate the CO2 amount of this delta, it comes to 1.22 kilograms CO2. I create more by printing a core than shooting a core. How much CO2 produces the, the burning of one liter of gasoline? Who knows? One liter of gasoline produces 2.4, 2.37, and one liter of diesel, 2.65 kilograms CO2. So you see this crazy factor of 4.3, which you create more CO2 with the core. And if you end up your present, or if I would end up my presentation just with the table, you could send me home and say, okay, forget it with the core printing. But if you imagine that this engine with this cylinder head saves about two liters per 100 kilometers fuel consumption due to this high combustion, then you have to see a completely different picture. So if you create 1.2 kilogram more CO2 when making the core, so once the car saves one in its life half a liter of gas, you have paid back the more effort in making. So and then it comes to the point that core printing could be a CO2 helper and a support. That's the big thing. And for sure also interesting is the costs. I said to you before, this was a whole factory full of machinery. And um, at the end, I listed up the costs and compared shooting versus printing. And also here, we don't go through all the details. I ended up in a factor of something 1 to 4, 4.5. Additionally, the productivity of the printer is, 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 is less compared to the core shooter. So all, all together, we end up in this 4.61 in this example here. So you can say one to five. One kilogram of core costs you five times more uh, printed than shot. If you do not take the tooling costs into account. And if you imagine a core shooter, typically lifetime of a core shooter, at least 20 years, many are older. How many core boxes do you buy, do you create, do you make for one core shooter during the lifetime of a core shooter? And I listed up here, one core box, there's not, not a big difference. But at a certain time, with 40 core boxes, I have even by the tooling costs, break even. I have my payback on this cost. So the critical point is here really the tooling. How expensive, how complex is your tooling? So also in this way, the commercially on the first view, very expensive printing line might make sense also commercially. If you compare that and summarize that a little bit, the printing saves you a lot of costs and time during the development. You don't need to wait for your pattern shop to make there, you can go ahead immediately. And if you change something, you change your 3AD model, a CAD model, and the next core is done according to that one. Printing allows you the full freedom of design. You're not limited by tooling. And it may avoid extra costs and efforts for core package assembly. Commercially, you have no doubt a high invest in the first beginning. But commercially effective, it may be when you take all the tooling into account. I had some neutral position. Okay, you need some. You don't need some spare for your uh, core boxes, but for sure the machine needs much more spaces. And the other thing is that's the last uh, the one, the requirement of skilled stuff. Such a core printer. This is so complex. You cannot take 
a daily based worker taking from a rental company and get a worker in there, press the button and press the stop button. This is a complex system. But on the other hand, you save for sure skilled stuff in your tool shop. Also, that is a point. Environmentally, I showed it with the CO2 example. Yes, there might be a little bit more CO2 production in there. But at the end, the casting produced with this kind of core can really bring the big payback on that. Yeah, and another outlook to the future beside the core printing, that is the big core. I showed it already before. That's a machine we delivered last year. I think it's the biggest in the moment in the world. Uh, 1,700 liter with a three meter by three meter core box. It's a ship diesel engine. It's a one slice of a, of a V engine. Uh, and this company, they do ship diesels, marine diesels from V6 to V18. Depends how your rubber boat, how many horsepowers you need. You can ask them to make your engine for that. And then they line up just a few more of this course. They have a front core and the end core, some additional cores. Um, and here also we come to a big point for sure. It's a very, very expensive machine. You need a lot of space on that. But switching the no bakes to, from the hand ramped to a, sh a shot core, you can save per core between two and four hours. On this big machine, we do 10 shots an hour. Cycle time is six minutes, including unloading the cores with an automatic system and refilling complete stuff. There's a connected line with automatic dipping and then a coating tank, putting them on an oven. So they did in the past one engine block a day. Now they do 15 a day, 15 ship diesels a day. I've heard there's now on the way from a Chinese manufacturer a 2000 liter machine also, but the core box dimensions are a little bit smaller. So this is one thing what we are also thinking about, maybe also to enlarge our jobbing core shop capabilities and uh, also deal with the people who do now in the moment no bake systems. Because here you can really improve your quality, you can reduce time. And if you just put a little bit intelligency in your in your molds and in your core boxes, many of the hand ramp core boxes can be adapted for shooting. And then you can see the quality what you typically need half a day, you do now in minutes. So this is also something for us here, I would say in Europe with the big issue of lack of stuff and the high cost pressure that we can survive in our foundries with this kind of technologies. For sure, for one small foundry, such a big machine is unpayable. It's much too, much too expensive. But if you group them, if you have jobbing core shops, that could be really, really one of the next issues in there. If you see the machine on the left-hand side, the machine is so big, there are 12 people in there. There's a dozen of people hidden. Even here on the top head, there are two people sitting in there. So this was really a huge machine. And I can tell you, I, uh, I did the first shot. This was the core of the first shot. I've never seen that core box before. It came from a Chinese pattern maker. I don't know if they did any simulation on that. So we put it on a machine and then my complete team stood around me and say, okay, Rudy, now say what is the parameters? Please set up the parameters. And I saw myself already sitting in the core box and hammering out the little core fractions and debris in there. But I can tell you the first core, the first shot was good. And it was 2.2 tons approximately here and there. They also integrate some cooling chills, what they put in the core box in the serial production. So also this is a quite interesting development. So complex cores on the printer, big cores on a big core shooter. I think this is something where we can survive here in Europe, also with our foundries, if we keep the technology going on there. Okay, so that's my presentation for today. I hope I could tell you a little bit of interesting things. If there are any questions, for sure I'm open to that. And sorry for my archaic dialect. It's a German dialect. I hope you could understand me. I will try to understand also yours. Thank you.